Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Casey Mukai and on behalf of YBE, I would like to thank you all for joining us for YBE's first event in our summer event series, Face-to-Face -face Queer Dharma. Um, to begin, we would first like to acknowledge that the land we are on, if you are currently in the US, is uh, stolen land due to the forced removal of the First Nations and Indigenous peoples. It is important that we understand this history that has brought us here to occupy this land and seek to understand our place within that history. Um, and although we are joining this call from many different places in the US, uh, we encourage you all to go to this link to acknowledge what land you're currently on. Um, so just a few logistic things. Um, we kindly request that our attendees stay for the whole event in order to build community. Feel free to use the chat box or um, use the reactions on Zoom if something resonates with you. And a reminder that the speaker and the panelists um, portions of, our, of this event will be recorded. However, the discussion breakout rooms will not be. Um, one of the most important things for today is just to be respectful of others. Um, so therefore, we have these community agreements, um, and I will send them in the chat, but feel free to put any in the chat that you would also like to see here as well. Uh, for those of you that are new with us here today, or if this is your first time hearing of YBE, uh, the Young Buddhist Editorial was started in January of 2020 by a group of young Japanese-American Jodo Shinshu Buddhists. Um, we were started with the intention of creating a space and platform for young Buddhists to foster growth, community, and interconnectedness while creating a dialogue between young Buddhists and other generations. The Social Justice Committee of YBE was started last summer in response to the murder of George Floyd and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, hosting a series of workshops on how we could approach and talk about race in our community. However, from there, we have grown to be so much more. And today we are so honored to have three esteemed guest panelists with us here today um, to talk with us about their identity as an LGBTQ plus member, as well as a Buddhist. Um, and so I will also send a brief schedule um, to the chat as well, just to give everyone a timestamp of how today will be going. Um, however, uh, the time may vary just because um, in Zoom, that tends to be the way things play out. But without further ado, we will actually start with a short meditation led by one of our panelists, Noah. Greetings, everyone. Thank you so very much for inviting me. I'm hoping that um, we could actually start off with a very brief meditation, about three minutes, um, with a silent meditation so that we can practice fully arriving at this space. So let's uh, find a, um, a comfortable position uh, that works for our, our bodies. Yeah. And for the next several minutes, let's simply it and breathe. Will you arrive?
Thank you. Great, thank you so much for that, Noel. Um, and now we will launch right into our panel, um, moderated by the wonderful Reverend CJ Sokugan Dunford. I am so happy to be here with everyone and to see all your wonderful faces. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists, starting with uh, Reverend Kesuke Limiaki, who uses he, him pronouns. Uh, Kesuke was born and raised in Tokyo, Japan, working as a Honganji priest uh, and administrative staff while there. He was displaced out of the traditional hegemony of masculinity and patriarchy uh, system of the temple community. The struggle provided him an opportunity to explore his grandfather's footsteps, who was an Issei Buddhist minister in Hawaii and Los Angeles back in the 19th century. Keisuke is ordained by Honganji in Japan as a Pure Land Buddhist priest and certified by the Buddhist Churches of America as the minister's assistant. He holds a Master of Letters in Pure Land Buddhist Studies from Ryukok University in Kyoto and is currently pursuing a certificate from the Buddhist Chaplaincy Program at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. With the completion of clinical pastoral education um, at UCSF and CPMC, he's working as a staff chaplain to support the most vulnerable populations in the city during the COVID-19 pandemic. His chaplaincy style is resilient and compassionate, and the goal is that no one should suffer alone. He's also advocating for people struggling with interse intersectional discrimination as a public example of Asian, LGBTQ, HIV positive, and displaced immigrants. Thank you, Kiske, for being here. Welcome. Um, our next panelist is uh, um, Noel Al uh, Mdip. Noel uses he, him pronouns uh, and is an actor, a best selling author, and a Buddhist pastor. He received his Master's of Divinity in Buddhist Chaplaincy at the University of the West and was ordained in 2015. Noel did HIV-AIDS work for over 20 years, and most of them was with the Asian Pacific AIDS Intervention Team, and is the founder of API Equality LA, an Asian LGBTQ uh, social justice organization. Welcome, Noel. So good to have you here. And then finally, uh, we have Juliet Both, who uses they, them, theirs pronouns. Juliet has been a member of the San Mateo Buddhist Temple since 2015. They were introduced to Jodo Shinshu Buddhism in middle school when their family started attending Sunday services, first at Palo Alto Buddhist Temple and then at the San Mateo Buddhist Temple. Since joining Junior Young Buddhist Association or Junior YBA in high school, They've been active in the young Jodo Shinshu Buddhist community, organizing social events, religious retreats, and making lifelong Dharma friends. Julia is currently a third year student at UC Davis and can be found leading Taiso before San Mateo Buddhist Temple Sunday morning service on Zoom. Welcome, Julia. It's so great to have you. Okay. So I think we're, we'll start off this part of um, the panel with a few questions. And so the first question, which is sort of uh, generally for everyone, um, maybe introduce anything that I might not have included about yourself and your path to Buddhism. Um, I'm just gonna, is it okay if I call on people or do people wanna volunteer? <laughs> okay. Well, KSK is right too beside me, so I'm going to ask if KSK would you mind going first? <laughs> sure. So the my path to the Buddhism, uh, it was not so easy, but the always the it was sustaining my spirituality and let me in a certain direction, like a compass or a navigation or I could say, <laughs> and then. Um, and uh, even if I seek run away, so but uh, it doesn't lead and always it must be. So then I had a significant two incident in my life to navigate myself. 
in the, into the Buddhism is uh, first is the, the loss of my friends, and then second is uh, kind of the um, living situations that changed in, in Tokyo and Hiroshima. So the uh, loss of the friends is a meet into the Buddhist life, and her name is Mio, and her fatal scooter accident impacted me to change that course of life. And then what I experienced at the funeral, um, every friends that they don't know what should, they should do, and they don't know how to accept and how to comfort each other. And I was also struggling to admit her real, like a reality. And even after seeing her body in a coffin, so I felt powerless moment badly because I couldn't find any way to support my friends and family members. So and then the experience is uh, kind of painful. <laughs> it's uh, also foundation my ministry. So I was able. So I would like to be. I decided I become a person who can keep objectivity in and still providing care for people in a life crisis. The motivation is still working here and now. And then I started to learn about the Buddhism. Back then, and I was not recognized as myself as a Buddhist. And at the same time, so my parents moved to, almost at the same time as my parents moved to Hiroshima, from to Tokyo to Hiroshima, and then to take over my family temple heritage. So my mother suggested I become a Buddhist priest and stop one of my father's career, new career. So he used to be a sailor, so I'm you know, a Buddhist priest, so then you sh I should do. And yes, uh, it's kind of the patriarchy system is uh, screening my life, <laughs> life goals, but it's, uh, I was surprised in the sequel nomination because I had not expressing it in that way to my career. But, but anyway, so I um yeah i had not thought myself as a book about this back then but as i started to think about it, and somehow i after summer first year study i received the ordination and i worked at honganji and honganji is uh i think is some in any case and i will put it's a pure land buddhism shin buddhist mother temple in kyoto and then it was so hard so because it's very binary society but the I was performed a good uh, model of male cisgender and questioning so air of the local temple communities so and then I think it's a yeah I the four years of working at the Honganji was a uh, kind of a turmoil but the yeah if I have a chance and I would like to share about it but <laughs> I will pause here as my story of introduction and path to Buddhism. So two reasons that in encouraging me to step into. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm having some technical difficulties, I think, but um, maybe Noah, would you mind going next? Sure. Um, Again, thank you for having me. Well, my I consider my my journey, my serious study into Buddhism, um, started in two thousand four when my father passed away. So his, his 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 death was moving to me, um, and one of the reasons why that was is um, uh, he fell back into the religion um, in which he was born into, uh, which was Catholicism. Um, I don't think he was necessarily a religious man, but um, Close to death, I think he became more religious, and uh, which led to me the questions: to what well, if I were to die, do I want to die with the religion I was born into, or, or die into a religion that, that I choose? Um, and uh, it could have been Catholicism, um, but uh, my journey thus led me elsewhere. Um, it was mentioned before I did. I worked in the Asian community for a very long time, specifically AIDS and HIV. And so um, the recognition of every space, particularly toward end of life care, was, was really important. And that included Buddhism and Hinduism. Um, and so it wasn't strange for me to, to pursue that path because my coworkers were, 
people I mean who were dying were were Buddhist. Um, uh, I began taking more seriously. Fortunately, in a, in a city like Los Angeles, there there are lots of opportunities to pursue the Buddhist path. <laughs> there are lots of, you know, Mavic, lots of spiritual paths in Los Angeles. And so I actually visited several sanghas, many sanghas, um, to see what which ones I sort of chilled with. And I knew it was a path for me. And um, also, too, since my work was in AIDS and HIV, was in LGBT communities, um, it was also very affirming. I was doing a lot of work around marriage equality, and it was the the only religion that um, uh, I believe the Buddhist churches of America said they could not find any scripture at all <laughs> condemning gay marriage. They said there was, there was nothing at all, you know. And also with the um, you know Buddhist lore, uh, Buddhist scriptures also filled with um, a lot of. Um, um, Gender bending, you know, sutras. A lot of, 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 you know, men becoming women, women becoming men. So it was not something that was that was strange, you know. Um, and so, uh, working in AIDS, also, I felt that um, that was a great opportunity for certain religions to rise to their very best. Truly, they could have really risen to their very best. And I did not see that. Um, so I wanted to uh, get my master's in divinity so I could be part of the solution. Yeah? Um, so that I could be there for LGBT people. I'm looking for spiritual guidance and assistance and community. So here I am. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And we're so glad you're here. <laughs> um, Juliet, how about you? Yeah, um, first, I want to say thank you to everyone who is attending and thank you to my fellow panelists. Um, I know it's just the first question, but I'm so excited to get into the thick of it with you, you all. Um, yeah, I think as CJ introduced, that was sort of, I, I had my family moved to California from the East Coast in 2013 maybe and then we kind of found our way to a local temple uh, I'm not sure if many of you are aware but there are not many uh, Jodo Shinji temples on the east coast so uh, it was a lot easier for us to find a community near where we lived on the on the west coast uh, in California um, and I kind of just hopped right in like to Dharma school and to um, junior YBA just kind of the Dharma school the pipeline um, to junior YBA pipeline is pretty tight um, and I started getting involved with other young folks like myself. Um, I think al along the way, I, uh, or early in my, I'm not sure if you could call it a career just yet, but early in my Buddhist uh, path, um, I encountered a program, um, it's no longer happening right now, but uh, it allowed uh, students or to train for a week with the Sacramento Bitsuin and become ordained sort of as, as young minister's assistant. And that was really my, introduction to uh, the, the doctrine, I guess, or like the scripture and really the teachings of the Dharma that goes beyond uh, the stuff we hear the once a week. And that was really uh, important, I guess, to, to cement um, my, my feeling of belonging in the, in the community. Uh, I think as Noel said, um, Buddhism, when you, when you read the Buddhist sutras or you try to reread the teachings, it's very different than anything I think we've been taught in an American society. Uh, and my exposure to other religion was um, pretty limited, but I think it's safe to say mostly just Christian stuff that's in the culture. Uh, and so it was really welcoming to find not only um, physical community in a, in a Sangha, but also a sort of philosophical community and a spiritual community and um, to walk a different path. Um, and I'd say this isn't necessarily a path to Buddhism, but rather my path in Buddhism. It's still going. Um, I'd like to make it a whole lifelong journey um, and that involves meeting folks like yourselves and building more community. Um, so that's where I am right now. Great, thank you. Those are wonderful reflections. I hope, I hope we get to hear more details as we continue. Um, our second question, 
is um, what are what do the intersections of your religion, your sexuality, your gender, and race mean to you? That is. What does it mean for you to be an LGBTQ Buddhist? And how does being Asian or Asian American come into play with those identities as they intersect? I'll just let anybody go who wants to go. <laughs> well, I can, I can jump in. Um, when we're talking about that intersection, I think that it, um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, be involved with, um, how do I say this, more traditional um, sanghas, um, temples, and um, monks and nuns from Asia. And so um, I think part of my work my karma actually is to help maybe more traditional Buddhists sort of understand queerness, you know? So for example, you know, some people were, we, we, we were having a very deep, intense conversation about, um, uh, about behavior, right? Um, about, uh, um, particularly, um, abstaining from, sexual misconduct and what we're sort of having this discussion well what does that mean right <laughs> you know, imagine having those conversations with 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 um monks from asia and you know um and it, it eventually led to well why did people make choices around you know sex sex and sexuality why you know are, is there even a choice you know in that and um can we uh take a look at sex and sexuality and gender um in a very different way we talk about impermanence and things change, right? Um, it became it was very specific when we began talking about prostitution um, and uh, uh, discussions around why do people engage in prostitution. And something I raised was, oh, well, you know, there there are actually a lot of homeless LGBT youth, and they're the highest, you know, is LGBT youth. And if you're young, you know, if you're trans and you have no skills and no one wants to hire you. You know, sometimes your only option might be prostitution, you know, as a way of survival, you know, engaging in survival sex, for example. So, uh, you know, imagine this was a very delicate conversation. <laughs> Just, you know, this was a very delicate conversation to be having, you know, with, um, with, uh, with monks um, from Asia. Um, and I think with that small conversation, I think he, he, there was a little bulb that sort of went off, you know, that was, oh, I never really saw it that way. I never thought of it that way, you know. Um, seeing prostitution as as economic means for people, you know, not as necessarily as as something that might be considered um, misconduct, you know, um, to have wider discussions too around what is what is sexual misconduct, right, and um, sexual behavior and sexuality. So, I feel that um, that kind of intersection was good because I don't think that conversation would have ever happened in this temple. If it weren't for my experiences as a, as a gay man, as a gay man working in an AIDS and HIV, which you know is affected obviously the LGBT community but marginalized communities, you know in general. So um, I think uh, to recognize it as um, as a as a a door open conversation. Maybe then I will follow in that uh, topic and then the sexuality and Asian Buddhism is a kind of still evolving and also we kind of tend to avoid it to talk about like a personal life and a privacy or sexuality. That is a I think we needed to uh, transform so in a in a healthier way to support others and then my, at my in multiple, I, as I have in my multiple, you know, the uh, intersectionalities and they gay or non-binary or non-native speaker or HIV positive and Japanese. So the what I experienced in Japan was the totally 
each category was a separated world. So being gay is uh, different from the being Buddhist, and uh, being Japanese is totally different from the kind of being Asian <laughs> or being HIV positive is also separated from being gay. So that is uh, kind of sadly and unfortunately a lot of um, marginalized people that still existing in this world and also in the United States as well, I believe, and which the, in, in the categories which they don't define by themselves. So and my, based on my experience in the um, <laughs> difficulty in the Honganji, working in Honganji, so I was struggling how to because I felt the in a prison to like make me behave only based on others or community's expectations to be a good uh, heir, good heir in a family temple. But I quit. <laughs> The four years of patience, <laughs> I proud of myself and I'm patience for four years being there because I didn't have any place to breath uh, for me. But the, yes, and then I came to United States and then yeah, it's a hardship, it's a following with that, it's a BCA and a BCSF and a different from the Honganji. It's interestingly, we are following the same tradition, same teaching, but different. And uh, they let me reframe the multiple intersectionality as uh, my advantage to have the unique views in which majority people cannot, maybe not easily to see and also um, different way to connect or the connections with the um, Buddha's message more. So that is my intersectionality. And also I think it's a like gay and HIV is also very difficult uh, intersectionality used to be. So the totally different being uh, the two uh, identify identification or define myself definition of myself, but the, um, because I hated myself to be gay and I hated to be myself as a STI infected pe person, and especially stigmatized disease, HIV. But the, I, um, yeah, I was totally shocked and without my knowledge and about this, how to support and prevent and uh, Okay. I don't, also, I was not I was not able to speak English and listening English and writing English and the and a poor international student. But the um, what I yeah did is I was totally confused, just the you know, the vulnerable, being vulnerable, upset, and I cried a lot when I got diagnosed in uh, here in the United States. My CD4 count was uh, for twenty two hundred eighty. They're almost and going to criterion ACE and because I think it's I got infected in HIV in Japan to be for leaving there um, at the incident and sexual assault so that is a uh, kind of too too much traumatizing than my experience and how I was wondering am I dying or I did not want to die and then how can I live with it There's so many questions in my mind and then yeah, it's interesting. I was talking a lot of life and death at the funeral memorial, but it became finally my mother's. So, and unfortunately, I had a, I met a lot of lovely San Francisco communities folks and the UCSF API Wellness Center, San Francisco Foundation, and the Buddhist Church of San Francisco's temple member. All of them welcomed the diversity, race, thought, sexes, age, ages, and backgrounds. So. And peer support group is especially helped me a lot to accept my internalized homophobia. That is my kind of my shadow side, or I didn't want to touch it for a while, but I finally accepted a part of my life. And I would like to let others and so how we are observing the others judge or 
other discourses and media or some gossip or the family values or something is a it's not literally yours but the accepting as a yours so that is affecting it by others so that is so since then i was disclosed myself publicly not to repeat the same trauma in others life and to let others keep in their resiliency especially displaced hiv positive lgbtq immigrant I think I'll round out the conversation a bit. Um, I, originally, I was going to answer this question of what it's like in navigating all these identities with, man, it's complex. But I think I think I really like Keisuke. I think I'm going to borrow the word of resiliency. It's really about resilience and being able to learn from navigating all of those uh, different spaces. And I think by that, I mean, um, sort of figuring out how and where to belong and when you belong and kind of trying to balance that with um, sacri not sacrificing, but figuring out who you are at the same time the, wor wor the world is trying to tell you who you're supposed to be or who you are and being okay with not meeting those expectations because those expectations aren't, you don't need them anyway. Um, I think, um, also like Noel, I like to think that learn, like growing up and navigating these space, like different spaces I, that I can bring conversations to the table that other folks wouldn't necessarily consider. Um, for example, in the queer community, um, bringing up issues of, uh, maybe religion, maybe, um, race, uh, in the Japanese American community, bringing up your queer identity, bringing up uh, the diversity of religion again, uh, and in the Buddhist community, really bringing those conversations to the table and grappling with what it means to balance kind of tradition with modernity and contemporary contemporary thoughts and the world we live in uh, today, which is, I think, American Buddhism is rapidly evolving in a very interesting space to have to navigate. Um, because it involves navigating so many different identities. Um, I think it's, this also requires a lot of introspection. I think Buddhism encourages lots and lots of introspection to look within yourself, to identify the three poisons in your own life, in your own actions, in your own mental habits and whatnot. Um, and being a queer person, especially being a queer person of color, um, involves a lot of introspection and thinking about um, really like who, who you are and what it means to be who you are and that your identity is constantly evolving. Uh, for example, I figured out my sexuality probably in late middle school, uh, but it, take, it took me until my second year of college to figure out, uh, hey, actually you might not be a girl. You're not a boy, but you're not a girl. Um, so constantly evolving uh, and kind of checking in with yourself is um, very, I think very central to, to the experience and also something that I hope that we can encourage for other folks, because it's not just queer folks who are doing a lot of thinking and um, to question your, yourself, your identity, the path you're on. Uh, I think everyone can benefit from having those conversations with themselves. Um, and I feel like uh, many B Buddhist traditions do encourage that. And so to bring that intersection with the kind of questions you ask yourself as a queer person, versus or maybe complementing the questions you ask yourself as a Buddhist. I feel like those are very important conversations to have with yourself and with others as well in the community. Um, yeah, I think that's my answer. May I, may I also add that I think the power in who we are here is to also um, uh, discuss or provide a, a spiritual alternative to um, queer people. Um, that um, queer people, I think according to a Pew report, like 50% of LGBT people don't identify 
with a religion or spirituality, right? I mean, that's that's high. I mean, I think the, the normal, I think in, in the general population, it's only 20%, right? And so it's, it's high for queer people. And we know why, right? <laughs> it's obvious why so many of them don't identify, but I think some of them want to identify, right? They just they just shut the door on, on religion or spirituality because of very obvious reasons that they're, they're experienced here in the United States. And I think that to provide an alternative for those who would like to pursue a spiritual path, um, and they and then they find that there, that there is actually um, a religion if they choose that can be affirming um, for queer people, um, for identities, yeah. And so that too also I have to say is um, a part of my inter intersectional being here. Yeah. And may I add also the the following the queer identities the. The, and the spirituality. So I think it's a, um, not only the tough experience or some the, it, yeah, involved in my the intersectionality. So some also the, I experienced a lot of fun with the similar queer folks. So the, based on my experience, I like a drag performance. <laughs> I was so feel released from the such a the social normative uh, the some like binding and toward that I think it everyone's experience regardless the queer or the LGBTQ heterosexual or that some sort of social um, normative the the like kind of called the cultural call is a release from the drug performance <laughs> and it was so fun and I it was so pleasure that the kind of gem of my life experience and how I released from the uh, binding what whatever is the binding and so for yourself and then by yourself and then also creating connection with others beyond the age or backgrounds so that is and so creating um, uh, intimacy, so regardless sexual or not, so the, just the bonding connection is a gift to be in in a real awareness of the inter the own intersectionality. Yeah. Thank you all so much for your profound thoughts. Um, you've given me a lot to think about. Uh, I want to process a lot of that. Some of those things I've thought about myself, but you all have such unique perspectives and you've contributed so much. Thank you. Um, <laughs> let's go to our next question, um, which is uh, our kind of a two-parter. Our panel is intentionally intergenerational. so. We're wondering for Keisuke and Noel, have you seen any noteworthy changes in, in the Buddhist communities you're part of in your lifetime when it comes to inclusion and advocacy for LGBTQ folks? Um, and what advice would you have for younger generations of queer Buddhists? And are there any helps? And the second one is, uh, for, the second part of this question is for Juliet. Um, What's one question or maybe a couple questions that you have for generations of queer and trans people who've uh, preceded you in the Buddhist community? Okay, then I will start. So as a, like a bicultural person, so in, in Japan and USA, and uh, I'm seeing uh, that I'm living in San Francisco, so that, that kind of gave me a so that I didn't feel any harsh discrimination against the LGBTQ people. However, the in Japan or in a, still the other states or some the, diff, the very conservative the area in the USA, LGBTQ folks are still in many hardship, like a social isolation or housing, job security, family relationships. So, but I observe, I'm observing also the gradually accepting in the, the movement. And then I've seen just this morning is a 
same-sex marriage was uh, accepting by the U.S. citizens and 70 percentage right now. So I don't I don't know that 30 percentage people are thinking about, but it still is a gr big numbers that which didn't happen, didn't see for us, and the 10 years later, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, uh, the a lot of changes happening. So, and I'm feeling very positively thinking about the um, younger generation, um, more than the, my generation. I'm 38 now, but, uh, especially uh, when, I, what, the, when I felt in that way, very positively thinking. So my, that is uh, provided by my niece that back then she was just seven years old. And then in 2016, so I married the TJ, my husband, at the British Church of San Francisco. And then my family members in arriving into San Francisco to celebrate on my wedding ceremony. And then I and my husband is trying not to hold hands or uh, not to hug in front of them because uh, kind of a cultural sensitivity and a strict cultural PDA, public display of affection. So in, especially in front of my mom. But it's a, um, at a San Francisco airport, my niece asked to me, just seven years old. So, and then, is it TJ a male? And Uncle KSK is also male. Why? And then it's a very innocent question. So because she had never seen, she had never experienced to be with the LGBTQ folks in, in Japan. So then my sister taught her so, you know, they love each other. So they married in the US. It's possible. It's beautiful. So that is, then my my niece was kind of thinking and sort of lay, and a couple of days later, my niece started to think about, so, oh, I need to be a Cupid with them. And so they are hesitating to hold hands. So that, so they chased, she chased them my hand and then so his hand and you love each other and worry, so you should hold hands together. And then she started to accepting, encouraging and supporting us beyond the culture. And then what I learned, so the, the next generation is more accessible for the non-biased information and then biased information as well, but non-biased information as well. And also the generation is changing. Then she accepted immediately. She, her uncle was gay. So I took 30 years to accept the fact that she did just one day. So there is big changes happening and she still communicating with us as usual, you know, as the, just a person and a person. So that is my hope that is next generation has a, a lot of potential to change the world. Yeah, it's, it's thrilling to see, um, you know, I'm, I'm 53 and so it's nice seeing, um, well, first of all, Buddhism in general becoming a lot more accepted in, in American society. And I think it's, it's exciting now seeing American Buddhism change and grow and um, seeing people adapt to it and seeing American Buddhism adapt also to. And I say American Buddhism because that's not necessarily true in Asia, but in American Buddhism, seeing it change and adapt. And one of the ways I, I um, sort of... Uh, well, work in my ministries, I teach, right? I teach um, young people and um, for uh, people, and they all, and my students have to do a presentation on some sort of social issue. And um, more and more students are willing to talk about, you know, being queer, you know, being gay. When there was a time that would they would have never, ever <laughs> you know, been able to talk about that. Now, I think one of the reasons they, they do that is because they know the professor was gay. <laughs> so, it's, you know, so I'm sure you know that's been a big change too, and I think that uh, more progressive organizations are looking for for those queer members to be a part of. You know, in addition to having people of color at 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 um, at the table, they also want to make sure that queer people are at the table. So if you're a queer person of color, well, hey, that's even you know, that's even better. You know? So to think that that being this, you know, being queer. You know, being Asian, being Filipino, all 
whatever it is is actually it has become assets in my life you know so to see that change um, when before that that was stuff i used to hide right i, I wanted to hide my queerness i wanted to i wanted to pass right um as american you know look how good my english is you see you know so so to um to be completely okay i I think the change is um, more people are feeling more comfortable in their own skin, which is exactly what we want. Yeah, so I, I appreciate that. Um, I think it's important for us to again share our our history. Um, that there are people who there are young people um, who think that we've always had gay marriage. I'm like, no, we've only had it since 2015. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're like, no, we've only had it. <laughs> You know, um, since 2015, people, at least in the United States, we, we, that it's only been legal since that time. And, and, and that they, they, they go, oh, I thought we've had it longer than life. No, actually, in your lifetime, um, it, it happened in your lifetime. And so I guess having to be able to bridge, I guess, the history with who they are and, and, um, and where they are and the freedom that they have today um, uh, was fought for and won. Yeah. So um, I think in this time period, seeing that kind of growth is really, really exciting. Now, I also say that with that kind of growth also comes a certain kind of pushback, right? That, 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 we all know there's a pushback out there, right? <laughs> you know, there's a pushback to who we are, um, whether it's our religion or our, our, our sexual or gen sexuality or gender, right? There is pushback. And I think that, um, as I say, that, uh, I think being able to really uh, use this time to affirm and strengthen my Buddhism um, has become um, more important than ever. And I, I got my advice too. So that is uh, following the Noel, the ad, the encouragement. So, and then pushing back is always constantly happening. So please educate yourself. And I'm also continuing the learning history from history and also uh, like we we can have access fully like Netflix or YouTube or whatever so you access the uh, a lot of the documentary and a lot of the drama TV shows and movies and then we can also talk with survivors in that dark era so and then if they are comfortable so they we can talk and then we can overcome that individually and also community based the type of um, invisible bias so yeah, invisible bias so sometimes they don't realize that so the, their behavior words uh, the accusing or assertive to the LGBTQ folks and family members Thank you both for your responses. Um, I hesitate to call you both elders, but it's it's so wonderful to see and to hear from uh, older generations. Uh, I guess, you, and you both have touched on this, but I think um, for some for folks who don't know in the queer community, a lot of the struggle is um, in in passing down that history. A lot of that history is. Uh, either written out of kind of mainstream education or buried or um, boiled down. Uh, and I think, especially for Asian American folks, you have that double, your Asian American history is also quite boiled down and re written out and excluded. And so for queer people of color, <laughs> that's like a, a double, double exclusion for us. And so my question would be, if you could teach young queer folks who are just coming out of the closet um, one thing of history that you've learned, or maybe one period of history that you've learned, um, what would you like us to know? What would you like us to study? Well, um, I guess the conversations that I've been having, particularly in the last year, um, uh, particularly about racism, racism, homophobia, othering, um, let's acknowledge that that affirms um, the first noble truth. <laughs> affirms there will be suffering, racism, homophobia, you know, all of that affirms that 
life can be sucky, right? And so um, to, to use the Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path to um, navigate this life, right? To navigate, you know, this um, this time and our and, and our our future growth and future, right? Um, and I say um, that uh, we can create our our own karma. I can get married today. I like to think because of um, uh, wheels that were that I was part of that we worked on back in the nineties, right? I mean, so, <laughs> you, know, I, 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 you know, so so we can benefit from our own karma. You know, we can possibly see it in this lifetime. Oftentimes we may not see our karma in, in this lifetime, but we can, you know, if, you know, if, if we work for things like, you know, um, uh, the betterment of society, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you asked that question because something I am, I am, Working toward, and I'm hoping younger people will understand as I as I sort of hit my senior years to please you know, think about universal health care, to think about <laughs> taking care of of those of us who are aging into a particular demographic. Um, you know, I I, I I like I said, life is suffering, and I, and I do you know worry about things like retirement and will will there be health care for me? You know, um, in my later years, you know. Um, and so for us to think about um, our karma, um, and if you, as young people, want to make sure that you, you die well, <laughs> that you lay the groundwork for that to happen. <laughs> Maybe then my answer is uh, uh, safety first. Safety first. So the other person could do successful coming out or successful identifying or reframing the, their gender expression, gender identity. Not everyone, unfortunately, may, some, sometimes it's very difficult, the outcome is related, uh, consequently happening. So safety is the first and uh, please be wise you know, who should share and how to share that you are the, um, awareness new awareness of your life and your identity uh, um, that is uh, that's reminded my friends who trying to come out but it's suddenly um disaster is uh, coming but otherwise is uh, other cases are very successful i don't know what's the cause of the effect what's the threshold of the uh, successful uh, result and um, unsuccessful result on the coming out but um, regardless, successful or unsuccessful, there is a safety first. Please um, be wise and be uh, cautious about who should tell and how to sell. And then also that is a reminded me also the um, you know human beings not bodhisattva. So we we are becoming, but <laughs> not yet. So that is uh, if that someone's attacking you or accusing you, so just leave leave them so and then uh, it it is not the worst for time and uh, and the rhinoceros uh, sutra said is uh, you know just just leave them so they need to be aware by them that by them all we can just do is just supporting their way we cannot change others perspective we cannot change the life <laughs> life perspective it is so tough and uh, it is not supposed to happen like a like a brain brainwash thing so like changing the someone's value so there is yeah safety is first that is um, i would like to say thank you both for your answers um i forgot to add earlier i just wanted to give you a sense of how old i am i was 15 when gay marriage was legalized um and so i think no you were definitely talking about um how I think it's not that long ago. I it was within my lifetime, and my lifetime is not even that long. <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, having a talking about history, getting to know folks who have survived, because I think uh, our community, a lot of um, the struggle is staying safe and staying, staying and being able to survive on to tell your story to the next generation. So thank you both for for your answers. Um, from a youngin.
Wow, that's great, great discussion. Thank you. Um, our last, our last uh, question that we have already prepared is um, about safety, actually, and I think this is good for us to think about. I know that everyone on our panel is a leader of some sort. Some people have more experience than others, but I think we're all in leadership positions. And so sometimes we can see safety in a couple of different ways. Like how do we implement safety as a leader in a temple or a community, but also how do we feel safe ourselves? Um, so our question is, what helped you feel included in Buddhism or sanghas that you've been a part of? Uh, were there any moments in your Buddhist journey that you didn't feel welcome or accepted? And um, do you have any thoughts or suggestions on what our allies in the audience can do to better advocate and support LGBTQ folks within the sanghas and Buddhist communities and even beyond the four walls of the temple? How about Juliet first? <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, so I guess I'll start with saying it's sometimes very difficult, or at least sometimes I have difficulty articulating what exactly or when exactly I felt sort of excluded or out of place or uh, maybe at the edge of the community. Um, because I think a lot of it is me trying to figure out oh, is it me internally feeling that way? Or is this actually the environment pushing back against me or is some combination of the both? Of both? Um, but I think the fact that I, I have felt this way is, is not particularly unique. I think lots of folks, and I think then become a lot secondhand and also, and I think very difficult to articulate sort of by nature, like culture is, or like the environments is, is more, a lot of what you feel and not necessarily what you can know or put your finger on, but you know, kind of walking into the room, um, I think we like to call it, we as in like young kids like to call it the vibe. If you walk into a room and you feel like the vibe or something is off, um, just the feeling is sort of <laughs> belonging or um, how you relate to other folks as well. Uh, I think has been sort of off by the cultures that we've cultivated. Um, and I think there are lots of folks who have who have written about these cultures and these systems and who can articulate it much more eloquently than I can, but a lot of it is feeling. Um, and I think the on the flip side, what has helped me feel included in Buddhism uh, or like in the sanghas I've been in is um, just talking about LGBTQ events, bringing that up, um, sometimes language, I think a lot of folks really look for language or symbols or signals that will tell you um, the vibe is good, that, the, <laughs> that you are welcome and that you are open to having that conversation. Because I think a lot of kids who are in the closet, and I was in the closet for a very long time, even after realizing that I had kind of come out, I didn't really know exactly how to come out. I was like, man, I'm wearing my rainbow belt. What else do I have to do? Um, <laughs> But I think uh, a lot of the, like the, a lot of the, <clears throat> it, what influences folks who, to come out is a perception of safety, is a perception of acceptance. And so if, I think a while, a, a few years back, I was on a panel actually with Casegate and someone in the audience asked, oh, what can Dharma school leaders do? Because I think as we, we're growing up, we're not just growing up in Dharma school in isolation, you know, you're bringing, everything from school, everything from your, your life, you're growing up in this community. Um, I think if you are a teacher or a leader or like a uh, advisor in the room, not assuming that everyone in the room is a certain way, I guess, or I guess not to assume that everyone is straight, that everyone uh, wants to talk about this all the time. And I guess being able to bring up events, even if no one in the room has expressed any interest in those events yet, being like, hey, there's this queer panel coming up, um, or hey, let's talk about LGBTQ issues, uh, or how to be a good ally. I think starting with like things like how to be a good ally will help you not out folks in the room, but will help you bring that conversation to the front. And I think just leaving folks the, a more open space to talk about the, the feelings that are hard to put your finger on, I think 
it is uh, one of the ways that has helped me feel more included in the song. And I guess addresses the other question too, is what can folks do is um, do, do some reading on your own. I think a lot of the burden of marginalized folks is constantly walking around explaining yourself. Uh, and that can definitely become burdensome. For some people it's routine and for others it's quite difficult to constantly have to again articulate because I feel like being is a lot of just feeling who you are and not trying to say who you are like if you are cisgender which means you've been assigned um, a gender at birth and you still identify with that how can you explain that like how do you know you're cis how do you know you're straight and if you ask those questions to yourself and you're like I don't actually know or I don't really want to talk about it treat others the way you want to be treated, I think. <laughs> um, so that would be something. I think I'll leave it there and leave it to the other folks to jump in. Yeah, I think um, I just wanted to add that uh, I want to affirm everything that, that Juliet had said. Um, something I've noticed in uh, American song is that we that we really need to be careful about saying my Buddhism is better than your Buddhism. Um, that I've seen that <laughs> sometimes. It, you know, um, I was at um, Buddhist conference and uh, one an American convert thought his Buddhism was better than um, an Asian American Buddhist Buddhism. Even though she'd been, her family's been Buddhist for like generations, and she's been a lifelong member of Suchi, the, the Buddhist, um, the Buddhist version of of um, the Salvation Army, right? Um, and so, we have to be careful about about that. Saying, you know, that um, I say, well, we still believe in the, you know, the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Paths, and let's use that as a starting point that we don't get into. My Buddhism is better than yours. My, my lineage is more pure. You know, the kind of thing <laughs> can be very, you know, dangerous in, in having. And I think that's the best part about having American Buddhism that there is this pan Buddhism that's going on. That um, I think I actually think American Buddhists have to work harder because we have to know the other different lineages as opposed to say being in Japan or Korea or Thailand where you just you're running one. Right. So to for us to be mindful of that um, and that uh, these discussions. Um, particularly for those of us who are American converts, that we're not bringing baggage from our old religions into Buddhism, right? Um, I heard the wonderful, the fine scholar Robert Thurman talk about how um, he didn't, he didn't, he would refuse ritual in Buddhism um, because the Buddha, Buddha talked about you no know, ritual. Um, he did say that, but he was referring to Brahmanical practices. Okay, so and and if you're you know that there's obviously a ritual in Buddhism. <laughs> if you've been in Buddhism, in, in Buddhism, there's ritual. But he came out and said, well, he, he didn't want to participate in Buddhism because that was a baggage from his Protestant years, um, uh, reflecting his anti-Catholic view of, of rituals of Catholic, of all, Catholic, uh, Catholic um, um, rituals. You know? So for us to also be mindful of that, right? America is a, a beautiful, wonderful place but we also have to be cognizant of our racist, oppressive past, right? We, you know, critical race theory is under attack right now. Um, and that too is also part of the Buddhism that we practice, right? We have to be careful about um, all forms of oppression that might be coming into, into Buddhism. Um, there are racist Buddhists, there are far right Buddhists, there are, you know, there are all sorts of Buddhists here, right? And that I guess we too, um, have to be particularly mindful of that in our practice, in our practices, and the, and the spaces that we that we occupy. Yeah. I believe, yeah, that is a very interesting topic. No, I was thinking the Western Buddhism versus Asian Buddhism is a so long history of the discourses happening um, beyond the academic the the world. So there is. 
I don't know how many times a minority group is uh, competing each other, which one is accepting in the majority group. So better. So it's uh, also happening in LGBTQ community. So then, you know, gay is better than lesbian. It's some um, discourses unfortunately happened a couple of decades ago. So that is not the right things to do because it's harmful. So Ahinsa is uh, one of the Buddhist uh, core values, not harmful others. So that is, uh, I think, a core point the, uh, to think about is that if, oh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> something is <laughs> off my background. But anyway, so I will continue that. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Apology. It's uh, one of the helpful thing is uh, um, in my community is uh, assumption is uh, less happening. So the my marital status, so relationship and gender uh, expression. So that is uh, one thing. Is uh, as that uh, Juliet also said is that like a feeling vibe is. Uh, the to share myself is it safe or not it's uh, i i didn't feel this that danger in my community fortunately that's why i think it is sticking in the us and also buddhist churches and american buddhist church in san francisco and then however the still challenging point is uh, sometimes happening especially in the episode is after couple times later in some Pride Parade, I was wearing a choo-choo and cut see-through the some, I don't know, like a pixie style <laughs> the wearing. So, and um, I don't know, high heel-ish something is uh, wearing that is uh, some folks it's not feel offensive to the Buddhist value. And uh, I received so many emails. But that is uh, my happiness and enjoy it to be myself and as a gay buddhist so i it's a, so hard to communicate the um have a, some no nope, i cannot say prejudice but it's a, something is a they feel it's the most important it's like a prioritizing the value <laughs> yeah rock said thank you juliet yes we walk together so, <laughs> and then pride parade uh, a couple of years ago and then um, what I wanted to say, the challenging, and all, or more I could say is uh, what we can improve more in the Buddhist community is how to communicate between LGBTQ folks and uh, allies, and uh, how to like, respond to anti-LGBTQ people. That is a uh, very challenging, but as, uh, as like a Buddhist uh, member, Buddhist community member in the Bay Area, especially Bay Area is a kind of relatively safer place as being an LGBTQ. So then we can initiate more how to communicate to others outside of the LGBTQ community. That is, uh, we needed to start to think about it. And then that is available to be, like, uh, to listen to others in person and uh, show your acceptance and uh, be genuine. That is one, three, I think what I emphasizing to do how to make it to call it community is more inclusive, not only LGBTQ person, but also beyond the um, group of categories. As Noel said, is that maybe we can start to talk about West Western. I don't want to say that the categories, but Western Buddhism and Asian Buddhism. So or the LGBTQ or allies or LGBTQ or questioning about the LGBTQ human rights of so the people. How to communicate? That is, yeah, it's tough, but it's uh, we can do it. Thank you. You all have shared so many wonderful insights and I really appreciate that. That's been a gift. And I hope I hope that all of our audience has had a wonderful time listening to you as well. Those are all of our questions we have prepared. Um, I think the plan was to uh, field questions from the audience now. Um, do we still want to go in that direction, Casey? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you to all the panelists for those wonderful answers. Um, we, I think we, I know we're running a bit over time and I apologize to folks for that, but I think we could maybe take like one or two questions if folks have any. We'll give it a second for if you want to unmute or put it in the chat. If not, always happy to jump to breakout rooms as well. Uh, I guess, if I may, um, Noel, you mentioned, you know, um, your experience uh, coming to Buddhism. Um, and in that story was, um, you know, you're uh, converting um, from a previous religion. And I'm just curious, um, as a Filipino American person myself, like, how did you navigate, um, you know, the intersection of queerness, of a non Catholic religion, um, you know, in a community that is so steeped in, you know, patriarchy in many ways, that's so steeped in Catholicism. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more of that if you are, feel comfortable sharing. Sure. Um, well, it wasn't easy. <laughs> um, but again, um, you know, uh, there will be suffering in this lifetime. Yeah. Uh, and that uh, having those very delicate conversations um, with family, particularly family, friends were, 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 were pretty good. But I think to, um, there's a, a wonderful scholar named Shenzhen Kong right now, who's got a wonderful book out about, and she says, be the refuge, you know, be the refuge. But I firmly believe that be the refuge, um, that uh, um, as difficult as it may be for us, I think it would be um, easier hopefully for younger generations when we do that. Um, I will say that um, my mother, I think the, the turning point for my mother, who was devoutly Catholic, I mean, devoutly Catholic, I mean, when when um, she voted against gay marriage, she has two gay sons, you know, and she voted against gay marriage, right? Um, and uh, so uh, having gay sons did not um, sway her opinion because the church told her to vote against it, right? Um, and still the, the love and compassion that must that must come with that um, for both of us, for both of us. She did come to my graduation and my ordination. At my, at my ordination, it was at a Chinese temple. And what did it for her was that one, there, there needed to be three masters to ordain us. Um, one was from China, one was from the United States, and one flew in from Manila. And that was a really big deal to her, that there was... Um, Buddhism in the Philippines was was really important to her, and it, um, now that the person who flew in was ethnically Chinese, but he was still. But to, to the idea that there was Buddhism in the Philippines, I think, made it okay for her, right? And so, I think part of this is to say, well, well, Buddhism is 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 also part. We don't realize how how. Uh, Buddhist or Hinduistic the Philippines is, for example, you know, I mean, um, Srivijaya, which is a kingdom in Southeast Asia, um, uh, was very influential, you know, um, Visaya is named after, as part of that kingdom, <laughs> That's, which is a main island in the Philippines, you know, so to, to that kind of education and that kind of education among ourselves, too, I think is, is really, really important. And to say that 30% um, you know, of uh, the Tagalog language is rooted in Sanskrit, for example, you know, is a really important thing to, to bring out. So I think um, being able to say that uh, Buddhism is, is also Filipino, yeah, um, is, uh, was really important. And I, and I say that a lot too, and I think there are actually a lot of Filipinos who are, who are, are turning to that as an alternative um, because um, Catholicism has not been working for them. It's worked for a lot of people. Yeah, it's worked for a lot of people like my mother and, and things, but um, I think part of, of this lifetime for someone like me to say, well, there, there are alternatives to how we believe. Thank you. And then we have um, another question from Lynn in the chat. How can temples and Sangha member, ally members be more active and advocating better spaces. And I know we kind of touched on this, but if anyone wants to elaborate more on their answers, um, 
I'll just leave it open for any panelists. Well, I'll say this because I've got a mouth and I'll say, you know, the, the busiest months for me are, are, are May and June because May is Asian History Month, right? And uh, June is LGBT Pride Month. So I'm, I'm asked to do panels like these all the time. Yeah, <laughs> so which is fine, which is awesome, because I know that that's a portal to have this discussion, that we have these discussions outside of these months, right? <laughs> outside of these months, and that the, 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 the boards of organizations reflect um, these various communities, you know, that reflect uh, people of color, reflect LGBT people, um, and that it be part of the essential fabric of organizations. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. It is, um, hmm. I was thinking in two ways. The first one is a very realistic and then pro pragmatic, so I could say it's the easiest way is, uh, is just uh, showing your presence and also is uh, something is a symbol. The you know rainbow rainbow is and I just uh, <laughs> fixed <laughs> my background, but it's a rainbow color. It is uh, anything is you can stick it like a put in sticker on it so your laptop or your cell phone case or whatever the notebook or what the inner life and then so the, the small items and so you can express in a without the words so that is a very very big meaning for the inclusive increasing increasing in the inclusiveness in the temple community and I knew that is uh, each temple has some struggles to organizing and keep motivating and also keep active the LGBTQ the groups. So in that case, is uh, I think it's a uh, you, you know the, this COVID nineteen is uh, the pros and the cons and the most likely cons. But is a uh, one thing is that uh, we appreciated the uh, Zoom. <laughs> we have Zoom now, so there is a uh, beyond the geographical barriers that we can connect each other. So it's not necessary to have the uh the, the individually working in a temple but we can collaborate beyond the regional barriers. So it's beyond the temples organization, like two or three temples can gather to have some events or like this event is also very diverse and then geographically. So that is the one example to keep thinking about it. So if it's a if your temple has the, some hardships, so maybe you can uh, collaborate with others in the who have a similar concerns or who have a successful uh, activities already established there. Great, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I think since we are running short on time, if our folks are okay with moving to breakout rooms really quick, because I think it'd be great to you know, have some conversation amongst the audience. Um, we wanted to actually continue on that kind of note of how we can be better allies and members. So we created just these questions to just stimulate some conversation within the breakout rooms. Feel free to address some of them or them all. Um, but I have made breakout rooms and I think I will bring you all back in about maybe 10 or 12 minutes. So see you all soon. Hi, Sydney. <laughs> how are you? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> good. Does the recording follow you? Oh, did it? Okay, wait, I'll pause. All right, I think that's everyone. Welcome back. Um, I hope you guys or everyone had great conversation. Um, I know that you know these conversations are definitely not just for this room and can definitely continue in our own spaces. And um, yeah, just really appreciative of all of you. Um, so I know since we're running on time, I just wanted to maybe conclude 
Um, we, is Reverend, oh yes, Reverend Amy is here and she will give a presentation on Ichimi. Really Hi everybody. Um, thank you very much, Casey, for inviting me and for allowing me to share a little about, bit about Ichimi. So um, I am currently an assistant minister at the West LA Buddhist Temple. Uh, but prior to that, I was um, a minister's assistant at the Gardena Buddhist Temple. And um, with the resident minister there, Reverend John Iwahara, um, we have uh, founded, along with, of course, the support of the Sangha members there, we have started a, a LGBTQ awareness in the Sangha group called Ichimi. And uh, Ichimi uh, is a term that's taken from um, our lineage's founder, Shinan, um, main what do you call is not a poem him chant it's like a chanting that we do uh called shoshinge shoshin nembutsuge and it's a it's a line from from there uh which uh describes how everybody in the um in amida buddha's pure land is like one flavor so ichimi means one flavor so um we chose this phrase to kind of you know encapsulate the idea that all of us uh under within Amida Buddha's Pure Land, are aspiring to be in Amida Buddha's Pure Land, um, are all one flavor and no matter who we are. So um, I just wanted to put a plug in for, I, I know that, so we're, we're always trying to put on activities that help Sangha members, um, you know, from all over, um, you know, come and have discussions about this, exactly like what we were talking about in the breakout rooms, you know, what can, we do as members of the LGBTQ community, um, as well as allies, uh, to help bring awareness to issues that might be in the Sangha. So, uh, for example, the very first, uh, we've had three, sem three seminars, four seminars, three seminars, I think. Uh, the first seminar was just generally um, bringing up issues of that there is an issue about LGBTQ marginalization within our sanghas. And um, that was about three or four years ago. And it was very impactful that actually many people didn't even realize that LGBTQ people were being marginalized within our Buddhist communities. And so um, that spurred a, like a little bit more support. And then um, our second seminar was on um, the, we, we, kind of following up to that and getting perspective similar to the panel today of people sharing their experiences growing up being Buddhist um, and queer. And then our, then we had, oh, so I guess we've had three and a half seminars. So we were supposed to have a fourth seminar, but it got canceled because of COVID. So it turned into a, a half day workshop. But uh, the, the third seminar was we had panelists of uh, parents of LGBTQ parents, like in the Sangha, because um, you know, this work has to also encompass the whole family unit, you know, that there's issues within that stem from the family often. And so um, that was our educational seminar. And so all of this is being done, of course, with the Dharma as the foundation, um, you know, so awareness of LGBTQ issues in uh, conjunction with, you know, Sangha, um, Sangha and Dharma. And so our fourth um, last mini workshop or half day workshop that we had was uh, discussing how we use gendered language in our sangha and our, in our service books, because uh, I'm not sure about other, Jap um, you know, Buddhist communities, but in our uh, Jodo Shinshu community in America, in many of our service books, it's still very gendered. Um, you know, a lot of these translations were done, you know, in the 60s or 70s and maybe not updated. So Amida Buddha is he, you know, um, when really Amida Buddha has no gender. For example, um, you know, in our three treasures in a lot of copies, it says brotherhood instead of like, you know, universe, like humanity, for example, um, just very gendered language. So that was the topic of our of our last seminar. And um, so after COVID, we hope to be able to continue, um, you know, doing these types of activities and, of course, invite all of you to to come. Um, so we have uh, I. Casey, I gave Casey our um, social media information, our website, and our email. So we have also put together a um, a guide, an LGBTQ resource guide for uh, LGBT. It's one guide that it's in a draft phase right now. So um, if you would like the copy, we can email it to you, and it will say draft. But we're in process of getting it printed into actual like 
fancy pamphlets to be able to pass out to all the temples to have it there, you know, in their lobby or in their uh, informational area. Um, so that's a little bit about the work that we've been doing. Ichimi was um, originally just started out as a as a seminar, educational seminar, but then we were able to get uh, support from the Gardena Sangha to turn it into an actual club organization. And um, we were inspired by San Francisco Buddhist churches, uh, LGBTQ group that they had a while ago um, because Elaine Donlin there, who's an assistant minister, um, you know, mentioned how important it is for when we have in our Jodo Shinshu community, when we have special services, they announce the different groups to go up to offer incense, right, officially. And how powerful that is to be able to have an LGBTQ group as part of that. So, um, so that's why we aspired to become an official club to, you know, have representation in the temple. And so, um, of course, our group is open to, uh, we, we want to provide a safe LGBT space for LGBTQ individuals, um, as well as any allies and, you know, supporters who wish to uh, participate in any of our events. So right now we have members, we don't have that many members, we have like 10 members, <laughs> but you all are all welcome to join if you wish, <laughs> or at least just be in our email list to, uh, you know, to be made aware of future events. So just please email us at, uh, at the email that uh, Casey will provide to you. And, and then, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, yeah, reach out. So thank you so much, Casey, and to YBE for allowing me to plug uh, Ichimi today. Thank you so much.